was trying to speak about what God was doing, and some of the things that she said didn't come across very clear, but I have yet to find that the Holy Spirit does not move through everything that she says anyway. She said in that thing something that bothered me a little bit. She said the Lord told her, and this is a dad, but she said the Lord told her that when she grew up, he was going to use her to deliver his people. And that kind of bothered me a little bit because that's a, you know, that's a big statement. Well, Robert Lowell, who is uh, a wonderful member of our church, he's a banker that used to live in Atlanta, came in here to snatch his wife out of this cultic place he was in. And as a result of that, got thrown literally. I watched it happen. Steve Hill was coming in the back door. Robert was trying to get out. Steve thought Robert wanted prayer. Robert was trying to get out of the way. <laughs> Neither one of them ever touched each other, but as Steve began to walk and Robert began to back up, as he got about five, four to five feet from the wall, the Holy Spirit literally lifted him up and threw him up against the wall back there. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. When that man got off the floor, though, he had a different view of what the Lord was, you know? He was kind of like I was. He was religious in nature, and he was living the kind of life that I lived before I got saved. That man got saved up against that wall that night. But he got on fire for the Lord, and this has been years ago, and, and what, four years ago, and he still is just as fiery as he was then. But he and his wife did a videotape called The Awesome God Testimony. And when The Awesome God Testimony came out, it was a powerful thing. Robert Lowell jumped this high off the stage talking about how the Lord had changed his life. And when that video came out, it was just wonderful. But when he came into the church, he was drawn to an eight-year-old child. Now, Robert at that time was about 47 years old, and he fell in love with my eight-year-old eight daughter. Now, that bothers dad sometimes, you know? This man jumped. We had to, we had to almost bleep part of his testimony because he was, I'm talking fresh Christian. And he said some things on there that normally you can't say in church. But uh, he, was, he was a wild man. And this was my daughter he was falling in love with. And I was a little worried about this thing until I realized what this love was. You see, the night that Robert came in and was thrown against the wall was the same night that Whitney was in the balcony doing this. And Robert came into the church and was drawn like a magnet. She, he and Whitney were drawn together like a magnet. And he had not at that time seen the Whitney Lane testimony. But when he did, he started weeping. And he said, now I know why I have a tie to this child. She snatched me out of hell. So now he goes, he and his wife travel the world, and they go out and tell the awesome God testimony, and they show the Whitney Lane testimony right after it. And then he says something very simple like, it took an eight-year-old to snatch me out of the pits of hell. What's it going to take to get you out? And the altars flood. I mean, just flood every time it happens. So God is doing what he said through Whitney, even though she didn't really understand it. And Lord, I know I didn't understand it, but he's already doing it. Speaking of understanding, anybody that would like to go to lunch today, if uh, Diana Coe does not want this card, we'll have a heyday somewhere. <laughs> Diana Coe, are you here this morning? Oh, she's coming in a hurry. She said, let me have that card. Man, I love these loose cards in here. <laughs> a few announcements that I need to make before we get started. Audio packs and video packs are available in the bookstore across the street. When I say across the street, it's just past, and some of you may have already found the place open at 11 o'clock this morning, but it's across the street. The audio and video packs are over there. Teresa Castleman's session has been such a great success. Today she continues with part two of that session she started yesterday. When we went all, walked over there to look and see, we had 100 chairs in the room, and there were people sitting all in the hall. So we're going to try to make it a little better. We're going to move you to the choir room, which is also just past the bookstore. There's a door in the side of that wing over there. Go through that door, and the first door to the right is the choir room. That's where you will be meeting today if you're in Teresa Castleman's second part two of her session. And um, that's during the rotation this afternoon. Also, we have been told that we are to meet at 5.30 p.m. at the Breezeway door for tonight's service. Now, the breezeway door is in this parking lot on the back side of the sanctuary that has that overhang, the big overhang, and the cafeteria or the old children's church is just ahead of that. What you're going to do is gather under that overhang, and Bill Bush is going to let you in at 530 into the main sanctuary. That's a major step. At first, you were going to... <laughs> Amen. At first, they were going to move you to the Family Life Center, the overflow, and just let you be there. And then if by chance we had room, then they'd shift you back. Well, they've made a decision that they're going to put you in the main sanctuary tonight. Now, 
If I had my way, I wouldn't let the main sanctuary have you tonight. I would cancel you going over there. We'd stay over here. And I'd be real selfish, and we'd do what we did last night again. <laughs> and my daughter even came to me, and she said, Dad, could we not cancel everybody going across to the sanctuary and just stay here? She said, just ask the people if they'd like to stay over here tonight <laughs> instead of going over there. And I thought very seriously about doing that until I realized why we're going. You see, when I planned this meeting, I planned that you guys would go over and experience what was happening in Revival. But after last night, I've come, up to a I've come to a different conclusion. <laughs> Tonight, they're going to experience what's over here. Okay? <laughs> You're going to take it there. All right? Amen. Pastor doesn't know what he's in for. Steve has no idea. And I thought seriously about calling Lindell and say, just get out of the way, the kids are coming, you know. But uh, they could, that group, they have no doubt about it, they could have played anywhere last night. They could have played Hills in Australia last night. Darlene Sheck would have gotten out of the way for this bunch last night. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, I firmly believe that I was completely out of line when I planned for you guys to go over there and get blessed tonight because I believe the blessing is going to be for the church because you're going to take it. Now, there's several things that I need to make sure you understand. If you get over there and they're tight and stiff, don't go with them. <laughs> I told Bill, I said, you better get them as close to the front because this is going to flavor tonight's service. And I don't want you to do anything any different over there than you've done over here, Okay. I'm going to wear a coat and tie tonight, but don't let that throw you off. <laughs> I know that might look a little different. For, I, I don't know. I might do like you guys. I may just come. I may come with my shirt tail out. My, uh, oh. I've never done that before, but I might just slip in without, without protocol. You guys do that all the time. Get away with it. I might try it myself. But... Um, I believe that the service over there tonight is going to be greatly affected by the spirit that God has placed in this room and in each of us, the, the spirit that God has allowed to, to permeate this place this week. So uh, I'm excited about what's going to happen in revival tonight because you guys are going to be there. Can you imagine, Richard, 400 on fire, pumped up, hit that building at one time? I'm not talking it takes two or three or half an hour to get things going. I'm talking about things are going when they walk in the door. <laughs> Woo! Linda's going to say, what in the world is this? <laughs> All right. Well, who's speaking today? John Tash, you're going to talk. John, let me get these things out of the way. I believe you're going to kick some this morning. I love watching this man kick. He kick higher. I believe he could about take that speaker down if you let him. But don't take my speakers down. Richard left those over here for me, and I sure do appreciate it. Richard, you made this place look real good for you, Left. <laughs> I sure do appreciate you setting all this stuff up for me. But um, we're going to be blessed today. We've got some wonderful speakers lined up today. This morning, John Tash will speak with us. And at 11 o'clock today, Richard Crisco will be sharing his heart. And uh, we're excited about the morning this afternoon. David, I think, is in the rotation, and I'll speak in the rotation. And uh, Teresa will speak in the rotation. And this afternoon, uh, that's the end of it. I think the, the rotation's the end of it. Well, the end of it so far. Now, tomorrow, let me tell you guys a little bit about tomorrow, particularly you folks who are leaving today. <laughs> we had no idea what tomorrow was going to be. You notice we said closing service and, and commissioning. But when I put that down there, I said, I don't know what it is, but uh, it looks good. I think Richard used that one time, and I copied it off of his paper, but um, I had no idea what it was going to be. But my mechanic is a visionary. God gives him visions, and I'm going to try to get him in here tomorrow. He may have to come in here with grease all over his clothes and stuff because he works on Saturday morning. And I'm going to try to get him to come in and share. If not, I'll share for him. And then there's a dear lady that came into our children's church a few weeks ago that gave a word that will just shake your, your it'll, just, it'll just turn you upside down. And I'm going to try to get Tammy to come in and speak. And I've had two ladies, one that has given me a piece of paper this week. You didn't know that you were doing this, 
but a lady who gave me a piece of paper, I don't know where you might be, that has a swirl of a hurricane on it. Where? Okay. That's going to be instrumental Saturday morning. And then there was another lady last night who gave me a testimony. She's from North Carolina. Where? Okay. The testimony that you guys, I want, you, I want, I want to get a copy of that because we're going to use that Saturday morning. Those words that God has given is going to be a catapult <laughs> that's going to take this thing out. This is going to be the capstone. We've been talking about the cornerstone, but this is going to be the capstone that is going to give this whole thing the <clears throat> that it needs to get out. It's going to give you guys that lifting. It's going to all of a sudden help you to understand the depth and the breadth and the, and the, the bigness of this whole thing with the children. So if you're not going to be here Saturday morning, you have just been, <laughs> you've just been bothered a lot. I know, man, I knew I shouldn't have made that air flight. And, and, um, but if you're going to be here Saturday morning, we're expecting some great things. People said, can we go out on the inner city in the afternoon? I don't know if we'll have an afternoon or not. <laughs> we may just go all through the afternoon and just go to church Saturday night. And, and by the way, again, I want to mention to all of you that we will be opening this building up for anyone who wants to stay here on Saturday, on Sunday morning for the services. We may have to put all the old folks in the balcony, but that's all right, as long as y'all don't jump off. <laughs> Last night, some of y'all would have. <laughs> I was surprised I didn't see any of you swinging from these chandeliers last night. <laughs> but anyway, John Tash, the blessing you are, would you come up here and bless these people? Thank you, my brother. Stand to your feet, everybody. Lift your hands up. Say, come on, Holy Ghost. <laughs> this is my time. This is my time. Come on, Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened this morning to see and to behold the great things that you have in store for us in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. You will manifest what you're full of. I said, you will manifest what you're full of. What are you full of this morning? I said, what are you full of this morning? If you're full of praise, let me hear it. If you're full of thanksgiving, let the Lord hear it. If you're full of the joy of the Lord, let the Lord hear it. Hallelujah. This is marvelous, my God, what you are doing. What you are doing today, this is marvelous. It is marvelous, Father. It's awesome. My God, you're an awesome God. And thank you, Father, for being so faithful. Oh, hallelujah. Bless you, Father. We bless you, Father. You may be seated. Hmm. We're living in awesome times. We are living in such awesome times. Our children are living in awesome times. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare to you today, you are not a glorified babysitter. I know some of you think you are. You're not. And you're not doing what you're doing because of a burden. Saints, you're doing what you're doing because of a call. And the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Burdens come and go. How many know that? Yeah. For most of you, they, they go every Sunday morning. <laughs> or if they're still there on Sunday morning, come Sunday afternoon, <laughs> where'd the burden go? Yeah. 
We're doing what we're doing, folks, because it's a call. You do, you, you be courageous and God will do the outrageous. Just go for it. A little girl was walking down the street one day, um, and she was eating a great big, huge ball of cotton candy. And a little, and a preacher was walking by and stopped and said, uh, how can a tiny little girl like you eat such a big ball of cotton candy? And that little girl looked up at that preacher and said, sir, I'm a lot bigger on the inside. <laughs> we have got to take the limits off of our children. We have got to take the limits off of God. And we've got to take the limits off of ourself. We've got to do it. For some, I mean, it, 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 it takes a whole bunch just to get their hands out of the pocket. For some people, it takes a whole bunch just to get the, your arms lifted up, your hands lifted up in praise. Let's do that again. Let's, let's just practice that. You know what that means right there? You know what you're doing? Do you see the position of your hands, folks? Do you see the position of your hands? What position is that? It's the I surrender position. <laughs> what are you saying? You're saying, God, everything that I have is yours. God, peel layers of flesh off of me. Peel them off, God. You see, folks, it's, it's after we surrender, we can do this. Are you ready? Turn our hands around in this position. Go ahead and try it. But first we have to surrender. When we surrender, then we receive. When we surrender, then we receive. We teach our children as you're entering into the presence of God, boys and girls, surrender all. And it shouldn't take a lifetime to surrender, should it? It's after you surrender, then you can turn your hands around in the I receive position. You see, I mentioned it the other night so often. We want God to touch us, touch us, touch me, God, bless me, God. And God does want to bless us. But have you ever tried touching God? Have you ever tried going to God and not even ask him for a thing? Just kind of hop up on his lap. I remember when my daughter did that. The first thing I said was, okay, okay, Nicole, what do you want? And to my surprise, she says, Daddy, I don't want anything. I just want to let you know that I love you. Melt. What do you want, daughter? What do you want? Do you want the moon? I'll give you the moon. When we go to our daddy God, and we jump up on his lap and just put our arms around him and say, Daddy, I love you. Don't you know that melts his heart? Oh, yeah. I remember the times. I'm going to get a little transparent here, but I remember the times. I would come home from the office at church sit down at the dinner table and my wife would be, begin to eat. My wife would begin to describe to me her experiences with God d during the day. With tears running down her face, she says, you see that brown chair in the family room? Jesus sat there today. Tears running down her face. And I sat on his lap. 
for two and a half hours, we just talked. And he ministered to me. I ministered to him. And I'm eating. And the thing that I'm thinking about, thinking, this is a woman thing. Sitting on the lap of Jesus. These tears all the time. This prayer and intercession thing is for the women. I'm in the ministry. I've got people to see and places to go. Let her pray for me as I keep the ministry going. I found I had a growing ministry, but a shrinking anointing. You see, folks, I was ministering from the bottom of the barrel instead of ministering from the overflow. I was busy, busy, busy. I was busy doing great things. I'm a minister. I'm a big fish in a small pond, and everyone knows me. I've got five people that are lined up between 8 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock this morning. Then I've got chapels to do, and I've got things to go, places to go, and people to see. And I'll remember, I remember the days. I'm speaking directly to the men in the house. I remember the days, the weeks, the months, the years that my wife would beg me as I'm running out the door every morning to head to the office to do the work of the ministry. She would say, can we just spend a little time in prayer? And I'd turn around and say a quick little 30-minute bless her God prayer and head out the door. You've got to remember, we're in the ministry for almost 30 years. I'm busy, busy, busy. Busy doing good things. But see, I was more of a human doing than a human being. That's all I was doing. I was doing, doing, doing. I had more of a zeal for the work of God than I had a passion for God. See, I would always let my wife go into the throne room and do the praying for me. I say to you men, it's time to rise up and be the man of God that call, God has called you to be. Times have changed. Praise God. It's different now. I was in this church, not this church, but a church just down the road, Jubilee Christian Center, just three years ago in November of 1996, where the Spirit of God got a hold of me big time. I was one of their speakers. I was sitting in the front row. It was a Tuesday morning. I was going to be speaking in the evening, but there was another fellow that was speaking that, that morning. And I was sitting down here in the front row. I was taking notes of the message and the Spirit of God began to show me some things. And I wasn't liking what I, I was seeing. But I saw a spiritual, my eyes were open, and I saw the whole thing as plain as day. I saw the man of God, he was a big man, come down the stairs and he began to pace back and forth in front of the audience as he began to, as he continued to preach. He just paced back and forth. But in the natural, he was still behind that pulpit. But I saw him pacing in front of the audience and he got in front of me and he pointed his finger at me and he said, Sir, Render to God. He continued walking. He went back up, got behind the pulpit, and I'm hearing this. Sir, render to God. Render to God. God, I've rendered everything to you. Look at all the good things that I'm doing. I'm preaching, I'm teaching. Look at all the children that I'm affecting. 
I'm going to countries around the world. God, I'm a good person. And I saw the man walk down the stairs again, begin to pace. And he got in, he got in my face this time. I mean, he got in my face and pointed his finger at me. And with a voice of authority, he said, Sir, render to God. And I begin to tremble on the inside. I begin to, something in my stomach. I mean, I've never had that before. And then tears started welling up in my eyes. I've never done that before. For 20 some years, my wife has never seen me cry. Because it's a man thing not to cry. And I'm sitting on that front row and she's to my left. And I'm going like this. And I'm hearing these words. Sir, render to God. 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 Surrender to God. Surrender to God. Surrender to God. Surrender to God. And all of a sudden, I feel this thing happening on the inside of my stomach. I begin to cry and to weep uncontrollably. I could not keep the tears back. My wife saw it. Everyone in the church began to see it. And before long, I was flat on my face eating carpet for four and a half hours. And as I was, as I was weeping and crying, I said, God, I'm a good person. But I kept hearing those words, surrender to God. But God, I'm a good person. Look at all I'm doing for you. And I kept hearing those words, surrender to God. And every time I would say I'm a good person, something would be literally being ripped out from my gut. It was painful. I mean, it was painful. I would say, God, I'm a good person. And ah, arrogance. But God, I'm a good person. Pride. But God, I'm a good person. Busyness. But God, I'm a good person. Self-righteous. Ah, my stomach after that four and a half hours was in so much pain. I mean, I, I felt like I couldn't cry another, another tear. But I could hear my wife over to my right interceding for her husband. You see, I was so busy, 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 serving, 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 working, doing this, doing that. For almost 30 years. You know, I did not have plan on talking about this, but I know I feel you tugging. I feel you tugging big time. I feel it from you, and I feel the heart of many of you men ready to break because you're there, and you know it's time for a change to take place. And just when I thought God was finished, I got up, I sat up, and I took a breath, and all of a sudden, he showed me another vision and here right in front of my eyes was this beautiful building that I've built over my lifetime and over to the right of that building was a bulldozer and I could hear this thing it was on and it was running and it was coming toward my building my life and all of a sudden, I begin to cry out even more, God, no, no, no. No, don't do it, God, don't do it, God, don't do it. But 
I saw that bulldozer, and it would not stop. It would not listen to me at all. And it came to my life, my building, and totally demolished it right down to the foundation. And he, son, you, he said, son, you're starting over. But this time, it's not going to be a labor in the flesh. It's going to be a labor in the spirit of God. And it was at that time, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you something, for two months after that, I did not have one meeting. I didn't want one meeting. I, never, I didn't go anywhere for two months. I stayed home. You know what I did? I had such a feast. I couldn't get out of this thing. I couldn't get away from his presence. That's all I wanted to do day in and day out is be with my God. You see, because I did not have a relationship with him. I knew him, but I really did not know him. I was born again at age six in my church in Buffalo, New York, Kensington Missionary Alliance Church, and I learned scriptures. I knew all the stories, but I, I did not have a relationship with my Heavenly Father. I would preach and teach, touch many lives, but I didn't have a relationship with my Father. For two months, I spent in the presence of my God, fasting. You know, what I, you know what I fasted? Work. Because I had to always be doing something. I always had to be going here and going there because there were so many people to reach. Oh, God, there's, there's, a, there's a herd and there's a dying world, and God, you've called me to save them all. But what I was doing, ladies and gentlemen, I was ministering from the bottom of the barrel, always crying out to God, God, I want your anointing. God, let the revival rain fall. God, let the winds of the God spirit begin to blow. Man, I was, before this time, a miserable Christian. And I believe there's people in the house here today. You are miserable. It's real quiet here this morning. I've been there, folks. And I never want to go back there again. Never. I've seen too much. The Spirit of God says, son, you will never go behind a pulpit again unless you're ministering from the overflow. And from that moment on, I haven't. Oh, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. But I'm talking about men and women that have such a hunger and thirst, my brother, for God. A hunger and thirst. You know, I saw it when I went to Russia for the first time back in 1995. I was ministering to about 600 people that traveled from six, seven time zones away just to hear the word of God. I mean, they didn't have a Bible in their hand. They had a page of the Bible. And they hung on to it like a piece of gold. And after I got finished ministering, literally, this is what happened. I had dozens of people that would come up Little old ladies that would come up and grab my feet on the platform and begin to kiss my feet with one hand having a, their Bible, one sheet of paper, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for telling us about Jesus. And I'm thinking, my God, where is the hunger? Where is my hunger for more of you? I was more of a human doing than a human being. I was a Martha so busy doing things for God, I didn't have time to be with my God. See, everything was a struggle for me before this time. 
Reading my Bible was a struggle. I had to force myself to get into the Bible. The only reason I read my Bible, you know why? Because I had three Sunday morning services to preach. And I had to have a fresh word. But during the week, man, it was a struggle. Praying was a struggle. I let my wife do it. Fasting was a struggle. You know, when I fasted, what I felt like, and I never felt like it, so I never did it. Giving my tithe and my offering was a struggle. I would cringe every time my wife would say, do you have the tithe ready? On Sunday morning. Ah, oh, no, God. Come on, I know I'm not the only one in the house that's been there. We're talking about, we're singing about being set free. I believe, I believe most people don't have any inclination what it's like to be free until you've been into the throne room of God and let God peel the layers of stinking flesh off of you. When I said the other night, man, you cannot, you cannot take kids into the throne room of God unless you've been there yourself. You can't teach them how to flow in the anointing of God unless the anointing of God flows through you. God never intended for us to do his will without his presence. He never intended for us to do his will without his anointing. It was that day I realized for the first time in my life what it meant when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross. I didn't know. I thought it was my mother-in-law or something like that. Take up your cross and follow me. It's the stinking flesh that's got to die. You see, there's only one reason for a cross. You know what it is? Death. It doesn't take a lightning brain to figure it out. And there's two crosses that are found in the Bible. The one Jesus died on and the one we have to die on. We have to go to the cross every day and kiss it. We've got to kiss the cross. We all know that there was a sign on the cross when they crucified Jesus. Jesus, the king of the Jews. You know what the sign on the cross is today? Next. Next. The stinking flesh always wants to be in control. How do you die to the flesh? I've got an easy solution. Don't feed it. If you don't feed something, sooner or later it's going to die. See, the increase of our spirit means there's got to be a decrease of the flesh. And so much of what we're doing with our children is ministering to them in the flesh. The stinking flesh. My God, you can go back to your churches and you can get out your curriculum and you can say, well, I've been to Brownsville where well, there's a revival happening. Well, if it's not happening on the inside of you, if you're not willing, sir, to spend time in prayer with your wife and your children every day, it will never happen in your church. I had to apologize. I'll never forget that January, that January evening in 1997. Remember that evening? Were you there? I had to apologize in front of everybody for my lack of prayer with my wife. And I want to tell you something. Since that night, I've been totally set free. Totally set free. And I pray for my wife every day. No matter where I'm at, what part of the, what, what nation of the world, I'm always on the phone with my wife. I just talked to her on the way here and prayed with her, prayed for her. And that's what we need to do with our families. It'll never happen in your classroom unless it's happening in your home. Where's the next revival going to take place? 
in our home? Where is the hardest place to be a Christian? It's not at the factory. It's not at the job. It's not at the office. It's in your, it's in your home. My God, if you can have a revival in your home, guess what? It'll, it'll come to the church. It will come to the church. That's why God has instructed us to build a family training center where we can train the entire family, where we can take children at a young age and equip them to do the work of the ministry, to train them in the five-fold ministry gifts at a young age and then give them a platform and say, now teach for the Spirit of the Lord is on you and has anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And these signs shall follow the preachers. And these signs shall follow the grown-ups. No, it doesn't say that. And these signs shall follow them that believe. That is why we've got to take the limits off of God, take the limits off of yourself, take the limits off of your children, and release them to do the work of the ministry. We have got to train them at a young age. But they'll never be trained unless you're disciplined. If you cannot find a time every day to spend time with your Father God, then you are too busy. You are a Martha. When Martha said in, 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 in Luke chapter 10, Jesus, get my sister to help me. Now Martha was doing a good thing. Not everyone invited Jesus into the home. And Martha was fixing a wonderful meal. And what was Mary doing? She was doing the thing that was needful, the Bible says. She was doing the one thing Jesus said that was needful. But Martha was cumbered about with many, many problems. She was so busy, 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 busy. And so many people I have found that are so busy serving in the church. It's a cover-up because they don't want a relationship with their heavenly Father. Look what I'm doing for you, Pastor. I serve on the, the board. Yes, I, I fix the Wednesday evening spaghetti dinner for the church. Goody, goody, two-shoes. If you don't have a relationship with your heavenly father, I'm getting right down to brass tacks here. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting through. I'm cutting through the fat. While we sit down in our comfortable little chair thinking we're just so spiritual and such a goody goody Christian, meanwhile, our kids are going to hell. How long do we have to know him before we trust him? Does it take 45, 50, 60 years? No. <sighs> Lift up your hands toward heaven. Father, seal this thing. Seal this thing. Seal this thing, Lord. I've spoken what you want me to sp speak, Lord. Seal this thing. My God, do whatever you need to do. But I'm asking you, God, to do it quickly because time is running out. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been pursuing his bride. Now it's time he is requiring his bride to pursue and to chase after him because God is no longer satisfied with distance. God shows up when people are hungry. How hungry and how, how desperate are you for more of God, saints? Will you continue doing things the way you've been doing them? Just going around the mountain one more time. You've gone around the mountain long enough. 
My God, it's time. It's time that we go to a new dimension in the things that God wants us to go to. It's time that we change our position. It's time that we change our position. See, I'll never see the sun rise if I'm facing west. I've got to change my position. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He changed his position. Why? He wanted to see Jesus. What did he do? He climbed up the sycamore tree. The woman with the issue of blood, what'd she do? She pressed through the crowd. She changed her position. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples were all looking at Jesus as he ascended into heaven. And the angels, the two angels said, why are you? What are you, what are you just there, standing there for, gazing up into heaven? Get going and doing what he told you to do. Go to the upper room. Get yourself in position. Folks, for many people, the move of God is going to pass right by them. Why? Because they have not got themselves in position. They're running on the old wine. Listen, we can't live in the old pattern of doing things with the, with the old wine. God is pouring out the new wine, but he's looking for the new wineskins to pour it into. How are the old wine? Can you use old wineskins again? Yeah, you sure can, but what has to be done with them? They've got to be soaked in the water. For days, soaked in the water. And then when they come out of the water, you take oil and rub it all over that wine skin so it's flexible, so it can, so it can, so it can move and expand. You see, God is expanding every one of us. He is stretching us. He's stretching us. He's stretching us. He's stretching us. He's stretching. Grab grab that that lady's hand. You grab that lady's hand. Yeah. Okay. He's stretching us. Stand up. About the four or five of you. Yeah. Are we being stretched right now? No. This is our comfort zone. (laughs) It's a dangerous place to be. It is. Let's stretch a little bit. Come on. Come on. Let's stretch. Oh, look how much territory we're covering now. (laughs) Oh, oh, we're beginning to stretch. It's beginning to hurt a little bit. Oh, but let's go back to our comfort zone (laughs) where it's comfortable. No, come on. I've been there. I've done that. I hate that life. I hate operating out of the flesh. See, God does not, God doesn't want us to be busy. He's called us to be fruitful. And if you ain't seen any fruit, if you still have the same 25 kids in your church, it's not your church's or pastor's fault. It's your fault. Come on. I can say it. I've been there. I'm at the end right here. God is stretching us. Yes. He's stretching yes. us. You know, this, this, is, this, this is hurting a little bit. I mean, this is hurting a little bit. It's uncomfortable. Good, good, good. It's all right. But you know what? When God gets finished, when God gets finished stretching us, you, aren't go, you ain't going to go back to your original form. No way. No, no. And I don't want to. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. My God, get your hands back up in the air again. Woo. Matter of fact, put your stuff down and stand up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Si la boriti la ba. Ye la bronde le bequera. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on, Holy Ghost. I refuse to go back to the place where I've been. I've got to go forward. I cannot go backwards. My God, my God, my God. Get us out of our comfort zone. Oh. Some of you are just a stone throw away from your victory. You are a stone throw away from your victory. Some of you, if you would just step out and begin to open up your mouth and cry out to God, you're going to feel something on the inside of you turning and churning and moving and going. Oh, Sikarapa. 
Yera ria ro riambo rasa. Yea ramba bara sata la ba yasa. Yela mora sikara talaba. He he he. I tell you what. I tell you what. Oh Lord jikara sata la bo rasi. God will give you a whole new reason to teach. He'll give you that whole new anointing as you preach. Things won't get stale anymore, man. No, no, no. New manna, new manna, new manna every day. Father, we can't live on yesterday's blessing. We want new stuff today. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, you can't get, you can't cast out flesh. People are always coming down in the front. Cast out the flesh. Cast out the sin. Get rid of the old nature. Ladies and gentlemen, I got news for you this morning. You can't cast out flesh. It's got to be, ooh. The only way it goes is through repentance. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Who's he talking to? My people doing wicked things. My people doing wicked things. If my people will get rid of and repent of the wicked ways, then will I heal their land. Oh, the Spirit of God is speaking expressly this morning to every one of us in the house. This is time, this is the hour, and this is the season, my God, where things have got to change. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. My God, this is exciting. Ooh. Oh, yeah, 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 it's exciting. But it's scary, God, it really is. Ooh. Oh. It's scary to lose half of your life. <laughs> but it's the most wonderful thing in the world when you let the Spirit of God just take control. My God, my God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See. Oh, Ratalabaya, see. Let that rumbling, let that rumbling continue. I'm going to ask you to sit down. Go ahead and sit down, but don't be sitting down in the spirit. Don't you dare sit down in the spirit. No, 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 no. Stand back up. Stand back up. Hey, come on. 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 Here de la ba ya satala ba. Here anda la da la ba ya randa la ba ba. Maleti karo to rasi le la ba. My God, let a spirit of repentance come in the house. Let a spirit of repentance come in the house. Let a spirit of repentance come in the house. Oh, de de la ba ya si le a to ro so re ta la ba ya sa. Oh, randa la ba. Oh, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah, let the banners fly, let the banners fly, oh, yeah, 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 ki randeleti la pariti krasa, hirata la bayasa, let the intercessors begin to pray, let the intercessors begin to pray, and that means more than just the women, let the intercessors let the army of men, intercessors, begin to cry out to God. For there's a call of repentance throughout the land. This is all God's part of God's last day plans. 
the people are crying, they're seeking God's face. Like never before, they're wanting his embrace. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what you need to do to change your position, but sir, ma'am, change your position. Change your position. Change your position. For some of you, it might be a rotten attitude that you just need to get rid of. For some of you, it's a critical attitude. Change your position and change it now. Slow obedience is no obedience. If you can't obey God in, in, a, in an atmosphere like this, you'll never be able to obey God out there. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Men, men, obey God. 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 Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, do we have a keyboard player? Do we have some of the band? Come on, come on, come on. Hirata, hiranda la ba ma ba rese. Hirabo ronda la ba ya si karaba. Hirela la 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 na mo ya sata. Hirela ba ya seka.